This episode is brought to you by our good friends at NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube TV. I'm sure by now you've all gotten back into your Sunday routines, but they could be even better. With NFL Sunday Ticket and YouTube TV, you get the most live NFL games all in one place, every game, every Sunday. And you can even watch up to four different games at once with Multiview, one of my favorite inventions of this decade. It's exactly what you need to catch all the action. Make your Sundays more magical. And also, YouTube TV is great. I got it this year. It's awesome. Sign up now at youtube.com slash BS. Device and content restrictions apply. Local and national games on YouTube TV. NFL Sunday ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. Hello there, Duke fans, and welcome to episode number 642 of the Duke Basketball Roundup. We are back. It's me, Donald Wine. I'm your host. We got Jason back from vacation. He is back. He didn't bring me any any party favors. Oh. He, didn't, he didn't bring nothing. No sand. Nothing. Like, But hey, Jason, how, <laughs> how was your vacation? Oh, it was fabulous. Went to Costa Rica. Uh, took my wife, took my two sons, took my two sons' girlfriends. That was a... That was a different experience. <laughs> oh, I believe it. <laughs> uh, right, you know, my whole life, it has been three guys and one girl in the family, and now suddenly it's three guys and th- I mean, no one's married yet, no one's engaged. This was, but from from a vacation but, standpoint, it's three guys and three girls. I was like, we had to your home your home field advantage has dwindled uh, <laughs> exactly. <quite a> bit. <laughs> well, and and it's worth noting that the girls have tremendous sway over my sons, <laughs> as um, you can well I, imagine. Yeah. All right. So the big thing. First of all, I should say Costa Rica, incredible. I've never been this close to multiple monkeys in my life. Like at one point we were walking along a hanging bridge, you know, when these things, it's like uh, at the tree line and uh, I mean, at the treetops, I should say. Uh, And we're watching some monkeys that were below us. That's how high the bridge was over this. uh, And and, they were about 30 or 40 feet below us. We're like, ah, it was really cool. We turn around and there's a monkey like on the bridge right behind us, like maybe 10 feet behind me. He's just chilling there watching us, watching them. And then he goes into a tree that's right next to the bridge. And we spent a half hour watching this one monkey and like three or four other monkeys five feet away from us, just eating. And it was unbelievable. But the thing I wanted to tell you about, Donald, was this. I climbed a waterfall. There's this beautiful, gorgeous, incredible waterfall. Uh, and, And we hiked. We had to hike a long way to get to it. And our guide mm-hmm. said, yeah, anyone who wants to can climb up to the top of the waterfall. And we thought that would mean you'd take a path or something. No, 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 no. You're literally <laughs> climbing the face of the waterfall as water is just crushing you. I, I can't even describe how much water is hitting you in the face, hitting you in the body. Uh, this was the most dangerous thing I've ever done in my life, Donald. Uh, we had a rope to like pull, but it wasn't like wrapped around you or anything. Mm-hmm. And my son went first. His girlfriend went second. And then I was going third. Donald, I'm 57. Not in the greatest shape of my life. Got about, oh, about 10 feet or so up. And I fell. (laughs) I fell hard, my friend. I am shocked that this company, that this tour company does this thing. I asked them afterwards. I was like, how often do people fall? They go, oh, it happens all the time. I'm like, yeah, it happens all the time. It was really hard, man. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, I've been to, I've been to Costa Rica. I've been to all parts of Costa Rica and, I, th- I believe you were at Arenal, uh, the volcano region. We, we were at three um, different places. We were at Arenal, yeah. we were in Monteverde, uh, which is the cloud forest, which is where we saw the monkeys. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw monkeys all over the place, I should say. And we were also yes. in Manuel Antonio on the coast, which was, uh, again, incredible animals. But yeah, go ahead. So yeah, in Arenal, we, did, we didn't do the climbing of the waterfall. We did the rappelling through the waterfall. Right, we thought um, about that. We decided not to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we did that, but it's it's a similar situation where they kind of, you know, you rappel down certain different things uh or you at least still zip line uh down z- certain things and sometimes you zip line, line yeah. through some some waterfall and it's great, man. It's nice and refreshing. Then you get to a point where you uh get to a thing where they kind of zoom you out into the middle of this like pool and then they just drop you from 60 feet. Um, you, you were, you were, you were harnessed in and stuff. So you, it's a controlled drop, but let me tell you, uh, never again, 
will I ever do that? That was that was <laughs> freaky uh, for me. I don't do that. Um, but it was it's a lot of fun, and, and I'm glad you had a great time. I, I had a great time. I, I should note. So we did the zip lining, and and for our zip line at the end, they had a mini bungee jump, where you essentially sort of the same thing you're describing, and and my wife did it. I was like, oh yeah, I, I can't believe you're doing this, sweetie. But yeah, uh, one mini bungee was about a fifty foot, fifty or sixty foot bungee jump that we did. All done. I've done that now. Don't need to do it again. <laughs> yeah, and and Costa Rica will always go back. Uh, a great, great place, and 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 very, very much highly recommend it for anyone. Whether you're going to the beach, whether you're doing the volcano, uh, whether you're doing the the rainforest, uh, whether you're doing I a mean, soccer waterfall. game. I've done it all. I've I've done it all. I love it all. Pura Vida, Costa Rica. Um, but Jason, we're not talking about Costa Rica in this episode. We're talking about basketball, and thankfully. We have some cool, cool stuff to discuss because, first of all, we have a great interview uh, that we just recorded a few minutes ago that we are going to give to you right now. Of course, the 2024-25 Duke men's basketball team is in the process of preparing for the season, and we have been trying it. And Jason has been trying, thankfully, for months to try and get one of the coaching staff to join us. Well, thankfully, we finally got one of them to join us. Jay Lucas, the associate head coach of Duke University has joined us for a, uh, a nice little conversation. We talk a little bit about the team. We talk about the coaching staff in general. We talk about the ACC. We talk about recruiting and NIL, the stuff that we can, but it's a great conversation. Jason, before we get to the uh, conversation, anything from you about what we just discussed uh, uh, about Jay Lucas? No, I want folks to really get a chance to listen to this. I've taken a lot of notes and Donald and I will take a commercial break after it's done. And then Donald and I will come back and, and recap some of the things that we thought were most important from it. But there's a lot of really, really interesting nuggets in here from Jay Lucas. I think he was very honest and revealing with us. And I just want um, folks to get a chance to listen to it. Let's go for it. And and thankfully, a perspective that we don't get often on this show, a perspective from one of the coaches, one of the current coaches on the staff. So here it is, that interview with Jay Lucas. Jay, we want to start off, we have a couple of categories that we want to get into, but we want to start with this year's team, and we want to clear the air with something first. We've heard a lot of things from a lot of people about how this team has been progressed over the summer, and everyone has seen uh, that has seen the team play has said that Khan Knipple has been outstanding and has been one of the biggest surprises of the summer. What do you say about that? Has he exceeded this, the staff's expectations with how he's played thus far? I mean, for us, we knew Khan was really good. Uh, and recruiting them the whole time and, and watching them and everything. I think the one thing that is really translated um, is just his shot-making ability. Of course, it's something that's why he was recruited, but just his ability to come in and do it. Uh, and then the way he trained and got prepared for college with his body, um, his physicality, his strength. You know, Khan has one of those games that's way above – his age, you know, he's kind of has one of those throwback YMCA grown man games. Um, and I think for him, that's something that's going to help us right away. And he did, he had a really good song. Um, and for us, I think he, he has worked himself into position to be a really big part of our team this year. And it's kind of what we expected uh, in recruiting him and getting him here. Um, but I think it's been more of a surprise for everybody else than it has been for us. An old man YMCA game is exactly what Jason and I have. So I know that resonates with, with us and a lot of our <laughs> listeners. Um, so we're looking forward to that. But uh, hopefully we'll a little bit better. About, yeah, much better, much better. Uh, you're not recruiting us anytime soon, nor should you. Uh, I think we've exhausted our, eligi our eligibility. But one guy who hasn't in the in the you know first year of his career at Duke uh, is Cooper Flagg. He's had all the buzz mm -hmm. throughout high school. Uh, even this summer, based on how he uh, some of the social media you guys released as well as what we saw at USA Select Camp talk about his play during the summer and how y'all as a coaching staff hope to build an offense around him. Well, you know, the one thing, the best thing about Cooper is he only cares about winning and competing. So he's an easy guy to play with. Uh, I think he's a little bit different than what you would presume a number one player and someone with all the hype to kind of be, he can affect the game and affect winning in so many ways. Um, I think that's, what makes him so good is just not about the scoring, which he can do, but it's about the shot blocking. It's about the rebound and it's about the ability to guard multiple positions on the court. Um, he can guard point guards. He can guard centers for position. Uh, but I think his, just his versatility 
uh, is the one thing that's been really pleasant and, and it, it stands out when you watch him and when you see him play. Um, and I think his ability to be unselfish also, uh, and what I was saying earlier, is, you know, most of the times you get these number one recruits and all they worry about is being a top draft pick and being the number one pick and things like that. And all he cares about is winning and trying to win a national championship. Uh, so it makes him easy to play with and uh, easy to coach as well. Because, you know, you're not having to coach certain things with him um, where the things you're having to coach is just the little details. Uh, and I think that's the best part about him and why he can't showcase well when he goes to an event like the USA Basketball and plays against those guys because, you know, he is in the mindset of what am I doing to help win and what am I doing to impact the game rather than all I need to do is score. So that's a big difference when with him. Looking at the entire team, you know, there's a lot of guys coming in. As you mentioned, you have a big freshman class coming in. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the portal guys that came in, but you had uh, several additions uh, from the transfer portal. How, how do you spread around the minutes? Are you feeling like you guys are going to go, you know, nine, 10 deep, or or is this going to be a situation where you, you start, you start deep and you kind of zero in on the guys that you think will help you down the clutch? Well, it's like you, all that stuff kind of works its way and, and works itself out throughout the course of the season. I think we do have a really deep, deep team, and we will play a lot of people, um, and everybody had a really good summer. Um, but I think the one thing about it, and, and you'll get to see, is that we, the way we built this team is you have a bunch of guys. You have four positions where those guys can all play together. You know, you may see different lineups that you're not accustomed to seeing because we have that type of size this year. And, you know, the biggest thing when having that is just who can you guard? And we have that defensively where we have multiple people that can guard multiple positions. We're big, bigger at a lot of positions. Uh, so that helps in having to play a lot of people also. So I think uh, initially, you know, we'll – everybody will get their shot and their opportunity and then what they do with it is kind of on them but we feel good about what we have and we have enough where we can roll out a bunch of different lineups and play a lot of different people you mentioned the size uh, of this team mm -hmm. duke likely begins the season as the tallest team in division one only spencer hubbard is under six five on this team so how do you plan to use that height to your advantage and how do you prepare in practice to play teams that are much smaller than duke because everyone's going to be smaller than duke Right. And I, I think that is kind of what I said. I think you'll see a much more aggressive play, both offensively and defensively, using that size to our advantage. Uh, you know, being able to switch a lot uh, will be a big thing for us on the perimeter because of the size. Uh, that'll eliminate a lot of stuff you have to guard. Uh, and then offensively, it's the same thing, using that size to get in the paint, being able to see, you know, different things you may not be able to see, but also being able to finish and, and get into the free throw line a lot more. Uh, it's something that, you know, you really focus on with that size. And then, you know, going against smaller teams, you know, that's something, you know, we have a skilled group where it shouldn't really impact us a lot. We have enough ball handling uh, in the backcourt. You know, you have Caleb, you have Tyrese, you have Sion, uh, Khan, Cooper, you know, all these guys can kind of initiate offense. Um, and I haven't even got to Isaiah and Darren also. So, you know, it's just you have multiple ways of being able to do things. So I think that's the biggest thing with the size. Uh, where it will come into play a lot will be mostly defensively. And then, you know, rebounding. If you want to win championships, you got to be able to rebound. Um, and I think the also the other thing with the bigs like Kamon um, and Malik uh, and Pat, you know, something that we kind of lacked last year that we had our first year uh, was his rim protection. Um, and I think the rim protection uh, with the size will be the other biggest difference from this year's team and last year's team. So uh, I'm going to switch topics now, Jay, if we can. And I, I want to get to recruiting and NIL. And I want to start by saying that I know that you cannot talk about any recruits by name. Not going to ask you for any names yeah. or anything like that. It's against the rules. But I want to talk to you about it in a general sense. By this point in 2022, a year ago, Sean Stewart, Caleb Foster, Jared McCain had all committed. TJ Power was like just days away from committing to Duke. You guys may have already known that he was committing, but, you know, in terms of public commitment. Um, by this point in 2021, Kyle Filipowski, Derek Whitehead already committed to Duke. Jaden Shute, Derek Lively, again, were just days away from committing. By this point today, no one is on board. And there's not even mm -hmm. like 
you know, the talk that we heard about some of these guys where, oh, uh, like I remember Jaden shoot, like it felt like a commitment was imminent to some extent. And we don't have that sense at all. Talk to me about how things are going differently this year versus past years. And by the way, it's worth noting that only two of the top 25 players in the 247 rankings have committed to anyone yet. So has the whole system just changed over the course of a year or so? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's kind of what it is and where it's going to go. You know, this thing, um, it could go a bunch of different ways, but the one thing you're starting to see is that people are waiting a little bit uh, to make commitments and make decisions, and there's multiple factors that go into that. NIL is one, but also I think now how big the portal has become, the high school kids are kind of more so on the fence about, well, if I do commit and do sign early, uh, what will the team look like in April? You know, you're saying I, I make this decision in November and then you bring in five new guys in April. Uh, it's a whole different environment and a whole different world. And I think it's it's affecting everybody. And like you said, I think um, two, I think two of the top fifty, maybe three of the top fifty, have committed. And there's one more, uh, one kid just announced he's making a decision on Friday, and that'll be four of the top fifty. Uh, so I just think this is where the landscape is going and it's headed. Uh, and it's only going to keep changing and keep being something different moving forward. Uh, so let's talk about NIL for a second. It's obviously a huge factor in all this stuff. I know you coaches are not allowed directly to be involved in that, but can you tell us how big of a role it plays in recruiting? I I've heard people say that, you know, it used to be relationships were the thing. And I've heard them say that nowadays the relationship is like 20% and NIL offers are like 80% of the decision-making process. Am I, am I crazy in saying that? Eh, not crazy, but it just depends who you're recruiting. Um, you know, and the caliber uh, of recruit there is. And I still think that um, relationships is a big part. Now, it's not as big as a part as it used to be where you would develop these relationships over years. And, you know, that would be, well, I'm coming because I have this certain relationship with the coaching staff. You know, it's still a big factor. I don't think it is as big as it used to be. And I think because how people are using NIL and the landscape has kind of changed it as well. Uh, so now it is, I would say it is a, the, if it's not the biggest part, it's probably the most important part, I will say, in most of the recruitments. Um, but it also depends on the recruit as well. Some kids um, can make a lot of NIL money outside of, you know, what is given, I guess, through, you know, some of these things that people require, like collectives and stuff like that, where it comes right. from more of a commercial of what it's supposed to be. Uh, so those, it's just a different, it depends on who the kid, who the recruit is, the people around them, I guess to say. Gotcha. Uh, one more question on this sort of arena. And you mentioned the portal earlier and the role it plays in team building. Um, this year, Duke brings in a highly touted freshman class, but we also bring in probably more impact transfers than at any point in Duke history. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, is this the future going forward? You know, are we going to see Duke continue to be multiple players who project as potential starters or major role players from the portal every year? And do you see there being a day where the best player on the team is someone that we bring in through the portal? Uh, I think it's going to change. You know, this is the last year of the COVID year. Um, right. So a lot of things will be different after this year. So after this year, you'll kind of see things kind of settle. Um, You know, I think we still – and, of course, the best talent we still feel comes out of high school. Uh, if you look at those guys like a Cooper flag, you're not going to find a Cooper flag in the portal, even if they're 24, 25. You know, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, but also you can, kind of like you say, you can fill in those gaps and those holes with really good players out the portal uh, and guys who are going to contribute and be key pieces uh, to the team. And you'll see that kind of with who we had and who we had come in this year as well. And also the portal is a good way to also get old um, and have some guys who are seasoned and who have been, you know, the final fours and been in certain wars and kind of alleviate the uh, learning curve a little bit with some of the freshmen. Um, and I think for us, you know, that's a big, a big key to some of the guys we brought in this year. Cause if you don't get in the portal as much, it's hard to get old. Uh, when you're having 10 sophomores and freshmen or 11 sophomores and freshmen, underclassmen and stuff like that, uh, it's kind of not where it 
was, let's say, six years ago, where you do need some older guys to kind of help uh, through the course of the season and to help you, you know, possibly win a championship. I want to shift gears from the players to the coaching staff. We obviously get to see and hear a lot about how players are doing and how they gel off the basketball court, but we don't get the view inside the lives of coaches very much. So we're glad that you're here uh, because we want to ask you, first of all, how has the coaching staff come together uh, so far over the, over the last year and describe life for you guys off the court and how you guys develop chemistry as a staff? Yeah, you know, well, with Coach Shire taking over, uh, that was like the start of a new, almost a new program. Even though, the, you know, Duke has been built, everything Coach K has done, his success, you can't talk about Duke without that. But then also you bring in the new head coach and the new staff, uh, Coach Shire's first year, and then after the first year, uh, we have another, you know, Emil Jefferson, who is a big part of it, gets the job with the with the Celtics, and we bring in Coach Dildy, who is well seasoned and has been a lot of places and and has done a lot of great things in the profession. So you know, it just kind of added on um, different layers to the program of giving outside perspective on what already is established and been built with what John has learned through Coach K and what he's seen, and also Coach Carewell. Um, but also you have these new positions that are able to do a lot more than they have been in the past. So you have a Will Avery and a Justin Robinson um, and Rachel Baker, who's our general manager. So, you know, the shaping of college staffs are a lot different, uh, just like recruiting than it has been in the years past. So, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing Coach Shire has done a great job of is really structuring his program of, of responsibilities and, and what he wants people to help and what he wants people to do. So I think he's done the best job of that. And so I think we're really equipped moving forward to kind of be on the forefront. And you can kind of see a bunch of people have started to hire GMs and do stuff like that. And that was kind of Coach Shire's vision from the beginning. You mentioned some of the uh, roles and responsibilities that that John Shire likes to to have. Uh, and you've mentioned all the different play people in the staff and some of the things that they may do. How do those get decided, or how do you get, how do you split those up? We we famously remember uh, when Wojo was on the staff here; he was the big man coach, and of course, he's not mm -hmm. a big man. But how do right. you res how do those roles and responsibilities get decided, and and do they change during the year based on need? Uh, coach Shire, it, it, you know, it's what he sees and what he envisions. Um, you know, we have everybody's equipped to do everything. Uh, you know, and that's the good thing about our staff is that, you know, everybody's been other places and have done other things. You know, even Coach Carroll was at Marquette with Wojo. So he did something completely different there that, than what he did, does here. But he also can draw back on that. Uh, same with me and same with Coach Dildy. So it really comes down for him. And uh, Coach Shire kind of assigns that, uh, you know, throughout the summer. And then in, in the summer, he may see something and may change in the fall. Uh, to what the responsibilities is. He does a great job of being adaptable to what is needed for us to work at our best. So, you know, we kind of follow his lead. And I, uh, the good thing about the staff is what I was saying. Uh, we have a bunch of people that kind of like our team is very versatile that are able to do a bunch of different things. This is your third season at Duke, and it, you're now an associate head coach. You've been that for the last year. For you personally, what has been the biggest challenge being an assistant coach and an associate head coach for the Duke Blue Devils. And how have you taken on that challenge as you continue to grow in your short and in your young career? Well, I think the biggest challenge uh, is just the timing of coming where, you know, Coach Shire was taking over a new program, but also the landscape of college basketball was changing. Uh, so, you know, everything that you've done prior to the last two years, you know, you knew how to recruit, you knew, you know, how to call, how to navigate certain things. It's all different. <laughs> So it's all brand new. So everything you've done before doesn't matter anymore. So it's almost like learning a new job uh, completely over again um, and having to navigate everything you said with the NIL and uh, just the new landscape of recruiting uh, and some of the new rules that they've, they've placed on us. So I think that's been the biggest challenge is just being adaptable and adjusting and knowing like, all right, this might have worked and just, uh, you know, help me back then. But now it's not going to work. Uh, and, and that's the biggest part that it, it has been. And, you know, the one thing uh, that is a privilege, but it's also, I guess, a pressure. It's just the expectation um, of being in, in national championship contention every year um, and having to build that team and work towards that. You know, everybody says they want to win national championship. That's what they're fighting for. But there's really an expectation here to kind of be in that picture and, and go to Final Fours and Elite Eights. But that's what you do it for. 
you know, you you kind of do it to be where we were last year, you know, half away from going to the Final Four and, and a step closer to competing for a national championship. Uh, so, you know, I would say those two things, um, I guess, are challenges, but they're also, you know, more uh, what you want to do and what you expect being here. All right, I'm going to bring it home with a couple questions about the ACC. Okay. How much do you guys look at the rest of the conference in the off season? <laughs> do you pay attention to who's coming and going via the portal or do you just kind of put that aside? <laughs> You're dealing with your own thing and you don't pay attention to the rest of the league very much. I mean, part of the job, you got to pay attention to everything, right? <laughs> it's just, yeah, right, it's right. just not the rest of the league, but it's, it's the whole landscape of college, knowing people's teams, uh, you know, other teams on the schedule, knowing what it's going to look like, uh, because it also kind of shapes what you need to do. Um, so, you know, if, if the landscape of the league was everybody's getting bigger and, you know, this is not it, but if they're getting bigger and playing too big, so you got to kind of adjust and adapt to that as well. So it's just kind of trying to stay ahead of it, but also knowing what's going on, but also focusing on yourself. That's the most important, you know, being the biggest, the biggest and best version of Duke uh, is the biggest thing, no matter what everybody else is doing. All right. Well, so if you do pay a little bit of attention to the rest of the conference, who are the going to be the biggest challenges next team? Who are, uh, next season? Who are they going to be the teams that battle you guys for the top of the league? Ooh, I think with the conference, it's a lot of uh, it's been a lot of change uh, this year. I think with you know, of course, looking at Carolina, uh, of course, with bringing back R.J. Davis and, and some of the people they have coming back, uh, and you know, they do a good job over there. So that will be one of them. Um, I think Louisville also with what uh, he uh, with what coach the new coach has done and in his portal and who he's been able to bring in. I think that'd be completely different as well. Uh, Notre Dame, I ha I think has a chance to be sneaky good. I know they lost one in the portal, but they also returned a lot and they were really young. Um, Georgia tech as well. Uh, they added a big transfer and had a lot of back too. Uh, so I think those two teams, uh, those couple teams are the ones that are kind of shocking. And then, you know, with the new teams like Stanford and SMU, you know, those guys and coaches, new coaches, you really haven't competed against them and you don't know, you know, you kind of know their style, but you don't know if they're going to change what they did at their schools before. So, you know, it's just a, it's a new league, but it's also exciting, but you also have some of those schools that are still around um, that, you know, will be kind of your toughest uh, opponents and also some of the new teams. It's exciting to be honest. All right. We will not let you get away without something that we have done on the DBR podcast for years. Anytime we have on someone who's on the team or a coach or something like that, we ask them for a good story about the head coach. Now, usually we're getting stories about Coach K because John Shire's right. tenure is so new. We got like we gotten stories about Coach K bringing a samurai sword into the locker room and other just crazy motivational stuff he's done. Give me your yeah. best John Shire story. Yeah, you you guys have been side by side for several years now. I want your best John Shire story that you can that you can share with the public. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, it's not really any crazy ones, but this will probably be the most obvious one. He's one of the most competitive people uh, you will ever be. So, the, you know, the thing we've the heard, thing this. we've seen like, this. Yeah. So he like still wants to play all the time and it doesn't matter what it is, like even if he's not any good. So like he thinks I grew up playing tennis uh, because of my father and his background. So course, Coach Shire yeah. thinks he's like the All-American. So now he had been training tennis and had this tennis coach and all this stuff, and now he's talking all this track and think he's going to beat me. So i just been smacking him the whole summer and the past <laughs> summers, you know, the whole time. But now, you know, he's one of those people that's ultra-competitive, so he's up like 6 a.m. training, trying to get ready. Uh, and then, you know, and that's the biggest thing about him. Uh, you know, he is the ultimate competitor. I know he has this calm, cool, collected demeanor on the sideline, but he is he is as competitive and has as high of a standard and accountability uh, for the program and the players and wanting to win um, as any coach I've ever been around. Uh, you know, so he hasn't done anything crazy for a summer wrestle or anything like that, and I'm sure it will kind of kick in. But, you know, his thing is just the way he – his competitive juices flow onto the players and the program uh, is one of the biggest things. Jay Lucas, we want to thank you so much for joining us, giving us this time. It's been a ton of fun. Hey, last thing before you go, you got a, got a message for Duke fans about what to expect this season? Just be ready and be excited. I mean, we always need you. You always do a great job. I think we have a team this year um, that you'll really be proud of. 
and really want to watch and cheer for. Um, and, you know, like any season, it is a long season. Uh, so there will be the ups and downs, but hopefully more ups than downs. Uh, but I think you will enjoy watching us. Uh, we have a really good group that's versatile, but are really competitive and want to win. And they enjoy being around each other and playing together. And I think you'll be able to see that uh, once we start playing. Thanks again for joining us here on the Duke Basketball Roundup. It's great to have you, man. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, we are back. And once again, thank you to Jay Lucas, again, the associate head coach of Duke men's basketball for joining us on the DBR podcast. It was 18 minutes or so uh, worth of interview, but I thought it had a lot of great information. Jason, again, a perspective that we don't get often. So it was great to get into the mind of one of the coaches who was trying to put together a championship basketball team. And that seems to be the goal for this team and the expectation. And they are showing it with you know, what they're doing in practice. Yeah, and, and uh, there's so much to to talk about from this interview. I, I I just wanted to highlight a few different things that I thought were really interesting. The fact that he mentioned Con Knipple's physicality and his build, I think is significant. I think it's so easy for us to just focus on Con the shooter, but but what we heard from Jay Lucas is that that Con's physicality is a major part of his game, and that's something that I don't I don't know that we've heard that much of from people. It's been speculated mm -hmm. on, but. But I, that's a really big deal um, in terms of being able to get your shot, being able to be an effective defender. Uh, as a freshman, to be physical is not easy. And for Khan to be impressing Jay Lucas in that kind of way, to me, that's a big deal. And this, and this is, again, no disrespect to to his build, right? Because as as we kind of joked on the, on, on the interview, uh, he kind of has an old man YMCA game and and. The funny thing is, is when guys step on the court against him, they're probably like, look at this guy. Like, he's not going to push me out of the pain. He's not going to shoot over me. And he's and when he's able to do that, again, that physicality will come as a surprise to teams, no matter how much they prepare for it. They're going to prepare for so many different guys on this team. And if they don't prepare for Khan, that is going to be dangerous because his physicality will be able to surprise teams, uh, especially early on in the season. So hopefully that is something that they're working on and saying, hey, when you come in, establish your game immediately because I guarantee you no one has uh, you know, spent hours in practice preparing for Conk and Nipple to play. Again, no disrespect to him. There's just so many weapons on this team that you have to pick and choose your battles. He is not going to be the one that they f focus on first, second, or third, and that's where he can come on and take advantage. Yeah, let's move now to Cooper Flagg. Uh, I just love, you hear this so often, but I just want to highlight it again. The winning mindset, the fact that this guy's a winner, that he's easy to coach. Uh, and, and I love that that Jay pointed out that, he, that, you know, big difference from other top recruits is that Cooper just isn't, he's not interested in being a scorer. Not that he's not a scorer, but it's not like he's coming in and he's like, the shots are mine. He's coming yeah, in. Yeah, give me like, 30 points. Yeah. Yeah. He's coming in and he's like, okay, what, what do we do together to win? And that, that is the thing that drives him more than anything else. It is a rare, a rare attribute to have that in a player. And and for Jay to then follow up, uh, you know, the question about how deep we will be. And and Jay talked about, you know, we're going to play a lot of people. You're going to see, you know, unusual, unaccustomed lineups because we have so many guys who can guard so many different positions and that we can switch a lot. He talked about the size so much and and how that that kind of height gives you a better vision of the court it, that seems so obvious, but it's not something that's talked about that much. Duke's like when Duke's guards go in the lane, when we penetrate, we're going to be able to see around better than usual because our guards are so big. And then the other part about being big is that you get to the free throw line a lot. That when teams, when you're bigger than other teams, they, their only defense sometimes is to foul. And I thought it was really interesting that Jay talked about that. Yeah. I, again, I, I asked the size question because it can be a gift and a curse, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. you know, being the tallest team in basketball, passing lanes are taller, right? You can see over defenses. But at the same time, we've seen, you know, bigger teams get neutralized by teams that have no guy over 6'4", because they can't run around with them. And I think the great thing is our physicality is good. One thing he didn't mention, but I think has been kind of evident in some of the social media we've seen from the team, is that this team is fast, too. 
And that is going to help us against those smaller teams. Now, I'm not, not talking about the ones that have a couple of trees and, and some guys, but I'm talking about the guys who early on the season we see that aren't going to have guys over 6'5", uh, when our, our second biggest guy is 6'5", right? So yeah. the idea is going to be if we're able to keep up with smaller guys, that neutralizes their only attribute that they can take advantage of against a bigger team. And when that happens, we then go back to the physicality, being able to see over everything. And I, I think that's a really good advantage to have. And I'm really looking forward. I think that's the part about this team I'm looking forward the most to seeing is how we take advantage of that size because we have a ton of it. Uh, as we move on with the interview with Jay, <laughs> recruiting, I'm like, so has the whole system changed? And he goes, yep. Whole yep. system <laughs> he said so that immediately. Please, like there was, just like, the, there was ladies no and gentlemen, hesitation. if you hear no, if you hear no like break between the end of Jason's question and the start of Jay's answer, it's because there was none. Like he finished, he was like, "Yep, that's exactly what it was." And you're just, and it's it's it, again, it's something that we've speculated on, but it's refreshing to hear from a coach that they kind of like in a way they don't know what the system is either uh, and how it's changed so much over the last few months. Yeah, and, and I, I know there are a lot of Duke fans out there. Look. I, Donald, you and I used to fill the summer with recruiting talk. <laughs> right. And it's like, that's just gone away. It's it's recruiting has been pushed way, way back. And the really interesting thing to me was that Jay said it's because of the portal. And kids are like, well, wait a second. I don't know what the team's going to look like in April. I, I think that you may see a lot more. We saw Liam McNeely was the big, big time player this year. For folks who don't know that name, top 10 recruit, fabulous in the McDonald's, you know, all the all-star games and and was a, a free agent essentially into the summer. I think you're going to see a lot. I think you may see a lot of kids. I, I'm talking high schoolers, the top high school players who may say, yeah, until I know how the portal shakes out, I don't know where I'm going to school. And that essentially they become essentially what used to happen in June, July, August, September, in terms of recruiting, is now going to happen in April. And it's not just going to be the portal, but it's also going to be high school kids, top tier high school kids who wait until then to figure out where they're going to school because it doesn't make sense to decide before the portal has decided for you. We kind of talked about that when Jamie Shaw was on the show, right? There's the early signing period, which is like November, and then you have the late signing period, which is March and April. And a lot of times they're asking, we asked about a couple of recruits that we have coming. We said, hey, are these guys planning, you know, doing things now rather than later? And a lot of the answers have been, yeah, they want to they want to take their time to do their visits. But the, a lot of guys want to make their decision before their high school season starts. But then there's some who are like, like you said, I'll wait until April when you see people entering the portal. And again, even that part's changing after after this year, because you won't have all the the COVID years uh, right. to use. Fifth year um, senior so go away. Yeah. that changes somewhat, but you you have that, basically you have guys who are incoming freshmen that are part of that transfer portal process. And I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic uh, if we see more of them. Now, do I think there's going to be a ton more? Maybe not, but that also, again, could change as, uh, as this you know, whole landscape changes over the next couple of months. Yeah, and it's worth noting that Jay, Jay did point out you ain't going to get a Cooper flag from the portal. <laughs> right. I mean, we talked about uh, Duke is clearly now looking to the portal to fill gaps, to create, you know, uh, rotation players for the team. But I specifically said best player in the team from the portal. It's not that Jay said no. Jay was like, you know, I don't know, but he was he was pretty clear. The kind of talent you get from a Jay Luke from a, sorry, from a Cooper flag. Uh, and frankly, you know, a common Mala watch, a con Knippel. That kind of talent, it just it it's really rare that you're going to find that kind of talent in the portal. That kind of talent's going to come from high school, and that Duke is still going to very much focus on high school. And then Don, last thing I wanted to mention really quickly, Notre Dame and Georgia Tech. He specifically called out those. Those are not two teams. And Louisville, yeah. And well, we've but Louisville's them, one yeah. of. I think people see. He said Carolina. If you tell me Carolina, then Louisville. There are not a lot of people. You know, right after Duke, there are not a lot of people who are going to say, "Oh, that's wrong." Those are two of the teams that are in everybody's mouth right now, talking about the ACC, along with Miami, along with Virginia, perhaps. But for him to specifically shout out Notre Dame and Georgia Tech, I think is really interesting. It'll cause me to take a second look at those two clubs, because those are not two teams who are automatically projected into the top half of the ACC. And, and I think it's, you know, 
I think Jay admitted that, you know, they're, they're doing some looking, but, you know, it's not like they're paying close, close attention to the rest of the conference. But I, I think it's very interesting that he noted those two clubs as ones that he's got his eye on. The last thing that I, I have on this was the uh, the coach, uh, the coach Shire story. Uh, about oh, it was him great. Going to great lengths to try and beat a guy who I, I if, if you remember correctly, Jason, he could have gone pro in tennis. Like, that's how good Jay Lucas is at tennis. He's not like some dude that is decent at it. He is like I think he was an All-American in high school at tennis and basketball. And for him to for for Sean Shire to like have a tennis coach and and get up at 6 a.m. and then like doing all, crazy. doing all these things to try and beat Jay Lucas at tennis, I think is hilarious. Uh, but again, I think that that kind of uh, mentality kind of bleeds into everything, right? That competitive spirit is what we, we've said they wanted is what they're saying they want. And it's what they are demonstrating as well. So when you see them competing at stuff, uh, I think is great. I think also, Jason, the last thing, uh, he going back to the Con Knipple, uh comparison to an old man YMCA game, I, I guess we got to go to uh, K Academy next year because this is the type of game they want. <laughs> we could give it to them at K Academy. We just need somebody to, to sponsor us, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Oh, baby, I don't know about that. I don't know my body going to take that. <laughs> I just fell off a waterfall, man. I don't know if I got the K Academy in me right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the waterfall is much bigger than uh, anybody at K Academy. So there's that. Uh, last thing I want to mention about the uh, the story and, and John Shire being hyper competitive. My bet is one of the reasons John Shire is such a great recruiter is because kids sense that sense of competition mm -hmm. from John Shire. Because all these kids, when they're looking for a program, yeah, they're looking for playing time. Yeah, they're looking for NIL. But you know what else they're looking for? They're looking for a team that's going to win. They want to. These guys want to be playing deep into March. They want to be playing into April. Let's put it that way. They want to be playing for a team that matters. They want to be a play, playing for a team where everyone's paying attention to you know whether that team wins or loses and where the opposition brings it every single time. Winning matters. And when you see a guy like John Shire, who is killing himself to try and be good enough at tennis to beat a member of the Lucas family. Jay Lucas, his father, John Lucas was con is considered more, uh, really great. I mean, he was a great basketball yes. player elite. Yeah. But, but I mean like really great tennis player uh, for John Shire to be like, I'm going to get good enough to be able to beat that guy. Come on. That's, that's a level of competition that is hard for the rest of us to understand. What's the what's the what's the saying from Top Gun? No points for second place. That type of competition. Uh, everybody's seeking to win. And if you everyone's in that train moving the same direction, you hopefully get a really elite team. And that's obviously what we hope this 2024-25 Duke men's basketball team will be. Jason, want to shift gears because there's a couple of small topics that we need to cover before we get out of here. The first thing is, uh, as you and I know, and everyone else out there knows, the Olympics are now done. Um they it was a great Olympics. I I I know you're in Costa Rica and and the way that the Olympics is presented outside of the United States is much different. So you probably didn't get the full Olympic experience that I did. But we have to send some congratulations to a few players uh, and one coach uh, who were part of gold medal or silver medal winning teams. Obviously, Jason Tatum, a member of the men's basketball team who captured gold over France in the final, in a, an epic final. And, and Jason, I don't know if you've seen the, that game. Oh, I've seen it. Woo. I don't care where you were in the world. You saw what Steph Curry that game was did. on. That, that <laughs> Steph Curry, that wow. was one of the great performances in Olympic basketball history. Period. Like end of story. That was amazing. Uh, but congratulations to Jason Tatum. He gets his second gold medal as a member of the men's basketball team. On the women's side, Chelsea Gray, also a two-time gold medalist. Now she was on the women's basketball team. They captured gold over France and, and somehow beat the epicness of the men's uh, final uh, with that women's final and, and how close it was all the way down to the very end. Uh, but Chelsea Gray and Kara Lawson, who was an assistant coach in the team, congratulations yep. to her. The, the I think the one thing that's a travesty about the Olympics is that coaches don't get medals. I will say that flat out. It's just but, wrong. It's, I agree. It's just wrong. But I will say this in the, in the, for Kara Lawson, she is a, you know, she's won an Olympic medal, a gold medal as a player. She is now the first coach to win a gold medal as a member of the 3x3 team and on the uh, the regular basketball team. She obviously was the coach of the women's 3x3 team in Tokyo 2020. They won the gold medal there. She brought Jackie Young and, and Kelsey Plum over to the, to the main squad, and they all won gold medals this time around. So I thought that was really cool. And then finally, Jason, before you comment, uh, Morgan Pearson, who is a triathlete, 
Uh, Morgan Pearson won silver as part of the triathlon mixed relay for the United States. So again, we got a silver medal, Duke, three medals overall at four, if you count Kara Lawson, but congratulations to Jason Tatum, Chelsea Gray, and Morgan Pearson, three Olympic athletes who are coming home with some silverware and some gold. Yeah. I wanted to comment on Kara Lawson. I have a feeling that Kara Lawson could coach anything. Like anything. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Three X. Anything. First of all, by the way. Yeah. 3x3 and 5-on-5 five five are very, very different games. They both involve basketballs and putting it through the hoop, but they are very different types of games. And the fact that she's coached two squads to gold medals in those two different disciplines is very impressive. But I have a feeling Kara Lawson is a coach, and coach of is sort of irrelevant. <laughs> and I wonder if she's in yeah. line for uh, potentially coaching one of their, you know, being the head coach of the main squad uh, in 2028. Again, it's coming to LA. Um, Cheryl Reeve may not be the coach for that in much longer. On the other side, on for the men, Steve Kerr may not be the coach. So there might be some changes. He won't be. Steve Kerr's already said he's not. He's Yeah, so there's going to be some changes done, yeah. on both sides. And it's, it'll be interesting to see who comes out of that. But uh, Kara Lawson for coach, head coach, I, I'm all for that. That would be amazing. But again, congratulations to everybody. Uh, from Team USA, but especially those three, uh, Jason Tatum, Chelsea Gray, Morgan Pearson, for getting medals at the Olympics. The last segment that we have, or the last subject that we have, Jason, is an anonymous coaches poll. And I know you saw this. Uh, it was from Gary Parrish and Matt Norlander of CBS Sports. Take us through what this poll conducted. And, of course, Duke is involved in it. That's the only reason why we're talking about it. Yeah, exactly. So th every year, the uh, uh, Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish do their Candid Coaches series where they where they talk to a whole bunch of different coaches, uh, anonymous, some of them assistants, some of them head coaches. Uh, everything is completely anonymous, so you get honest opinions about things. And the question that I saw that I wanted to highlight today is the simple question of who will be the best team this coming season. Uh, they ask coaches all across the country in Kansas – comes in first. And this is not a surprise that Kansas should be number one. Everyone, Kansas is pretty much widely considered the preseason number one team. 35, better than 35% of the coaches who responded to this survey said Kansas should be the number one team. Alabama's next at 28%. Houston at 13.5% is third. And then the team that's number four, again, among the coaches in the country, number four team is Duke at almost 10% of coaches saying that Duke is the best team in the country. And the reason I wanted to highlight it is we've seen like other preseason polls and the such. Most of the folks seem to have Duke six, seven. I've seen a lot of eight, nine kind of ranges. Mm -hmm. The people who are skeptical of a freshman dominated team, Duke does have some experience, a lot of experience more than we've had. You know, you guys talked about it on the last podcast, uh, a phenomenal amount of experience, but not experience at Duke. And, and so I think that's why some coaches were, I'm, I'm sorry, that's why some pro prognosticators have been a little less certain about Duke, but the coaches, the guys who really know this stuff, um, they, they're pretty high on Duke. And, and I thought the comment that Parrish and Norlander put in their article about Duke was interesting. They said that, you know, one coach in particular had said to them, the question is how good is Cooper flag going to be? Uh, this coach said, I think he's going to be great, and there's more than enough good pieces around him for Duke to win it all. And the coach said, this is the most talented team in the country. We just have to see if it comes all together, because if it does, the talent is there to win it all. That's the season we have coming ahead for us. There's little question that this is a incredibly, incredibly talented Duke team. Um, you know, I, I think that when all is said and done, we're going to be looking at it and comparing it to other Duke greats, maybe not in terms of what they accomplish. I hope it'll be in terms of what they accomplish, but regardless of what they accomplish, I think that, you know, several years down the road, we'll be looking back at this team and being like, okay, in terms of what these guys became, in terms of what they achieved in their NBA careers, we're going to be wondering, you know, where's this Duke team stack up? And I think it's going to stack up pretty well against some of the all-time greats. And, Keep in mind that this particular poll was not a poll in the traditional sense. It wasn't a one through 25 vote. It was just one question. Who do you think will be the best team this season? So if you answer Kansas, there was no, who do you think will be second, right? So Duke being the fourth team in this, uh, in this answer, receiving the fourth most, you know, votes uh, in this question doesn't necessarily mean that they're the fourth best team, according to these coaches, but it, you know, 
as you know, first place votes can be spread up and down uh, any poll. But I think what it means is that a lot of teams, like you said, uh, think of Kansas as the, as the standard this year to beat. And the great thing is Duke is going to have opportunities to show that this team is who we think it is. And they're going to have early ones. They're going to even have a late one, as you, as we've discussed on the show, but was made official just today. Uh, the Illinois game at Madison Square Garden is set for uh, February 22nd. So you have these opportunities for Duke, not just in the ACC and not just against North Carolina, right? Because those are the, we, we know about those, but against teams that we wouldn't traditionally see on a regular basis, we get a chance to show them and by then show the coaches and the vote and the AP voters, hey, this team's for real. Hey, Cooper Flag might be the best thing since sliced bread, but he also has a team around him that's really, really elite. And I think we'll get opportunities to do that. We also will, you know, have some chances where we might stumble, right? Every one of those games is going to be a test. But I think what Jay Lucas has said, what everyone has said about this team and about all these different parts is that all of them want to win. All of them are competitive. And we will get to finally, uh, very, very soon, get to see that competitive spirit tested against somebody else. And I think that's the key here. All right. And then really quick, the candid coaches survey that they did. They also asked who's the best player in college basketball next year. Who will be college hoops best player in 24, 25. I'm not going to say the overwhelming number one pick because it was kind of a little bit close, but the number one pick was Cooper flag by these coaches. 36% of them said Cooper flag will be college basketball's best player. Mark Sears of Alabama was second at 22%. Hunter Dickinson, RJ Davis are both in the teens, but college basketball coaches say they are on board the Cooper flag hype train. He has it all size, athleticism, competitive spirit, toughness. And these coaches commented they love that he's surrounded by older guys at Duke who are going to teach him a little bit and, and really guide him in the ways to exploit his talent. So, I'm excited. How about yeah, you, and I think <laughs> yeah, and I think the difference is right. Like when we talk about past freshman-led teams for Duke, they were mostly freshmen in the starting lineup. They were mostly freshmen that were getting a line share of the minutes. You may have had a couple of upperclassmen, but for the most part, it was a freshman-led team meant a freshman-led team. Cooper Flag could lead this team, but you got so many guys who are upperclassmen who could also be right there with them as far as leading. This team, not just in, not in points or rebounds or any stats, but just being a, a presence on the floor where, again, when I'm an opposing team and as a coach, I'm trying to prepare for a game against Duke. I have to mark down who the guys I think are going to be most prone to beat us. Cooper flag is going to be on everybody's board, but so could Tyrese Proctor. So could, you know, come and my watch. So could see James, right? So could con can nipple. Like there's guys on this team uh, you know, Caleb Foster, like, Hey, we got to watch out for him because if he gets off, then, then it's a wrap. The great thing about, uh, for, about it for us is that we don't have to prepare for us, but other teams <laughs> do. And yeah. other teams are going to have a, a fit, especially early on the season after Cooper flag, yo, Hey, if you want to give Cooper flag, their 25 points, his 25 points and say, everyone else on the team's got to beat us. Who's going to be that guy? And I think on our end, that's going to be the question that will present itself early in the season. Who's going to be that other guy uh, or other guys that step up on a regular basis and say, yeah, you, you don't just have to go through Cooper. You got to go through me too, right, on offense and on defense. And I think that's what that's what excites me about this team is that we don't know the answers to that. We think we do, right? We think we have some ideas of how it could go individually, how players could shine. But once they all get on a court together against another team, and another team is trying to actively beat you, that is going to be where we see this. And the great thing is we're going to have these tests early that will really excite college basketball fans. Well, and I think the interesting thing is that unlike Duke teams that have relied on freshmen, because it is entirely possible. Look, there's there's a world where Duke is starting three freshmen this year. I'm not saying that's definitely going to happen, but that's right. not impossible to imagine by any stretch of the imagination. Unlike past teams, past Duke teams that had a lot of freshmen, there is so much established college basketball talent on this Duke team that you're not going to be starting the freshman because you don't have something else to fall back on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean this this Duke team, any freshman who starts is going to anyone who starts. Period. End of story. Is going to earn that position by battling against established college basketball players, guys who've shown that they are 
impact players in major conferences, guys deserving of major minutes elsewhere. You're going to have to beat out someone like that to start for this year's Duke team. If it happens to be freshmen, fine. It just means that they are truly elite freshmen who are capable of beating out established college guys. And if it's not freshmen, great, because those, you know, those guys we got from other teams, they are really good already. You could have a lineup, as you mentioned, that has three freshmen and two upperclassmen in the starting lineup. You could also have a lineup that has Cooper flag surrounded by four upperclassmen. Like that's, that's where we're at right now is you have those options. Uh, and, and I think that's what's, it, that's what makes this whole thing so much. Uh, we still have that anticipation factor, which I really like. It's not like, Hey, we know what we're going to do. We just got to go out and prove it. But we have guys that could step up, right? Conkin could come off the bench. He could start. Sion James could come off the bench. He could start. Mason Gillis could start or sit on the bench. Like, you know, Pat and Gong could Brown. start get 25 minutes yeah. And or he could get he can get five minutes, right? We we don't know. Uh, but I think the idea here is is when we say freshman led team, they're talking about Cooper Flag nationally, internally. Yeah. We're talking about a legion of guys who each of which has the capability of stepping up, and that's what makes this all so so awesome to witness and also just to prepare for. Jason, last you know, one. Donald, we should really ask one of the coaches how deep they think the team will go this year. <laughs> uh well you and i hey, we just we, did that el- eligibility so we can't go 17 deep uh unfortunately yeah. um but who knows hey the idea is early in the season i hope we go 15 deep because that means that spencer hubbard and stanley borden and all those guys are getting playing time because we're waxing people by 40 um that would be great to start 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 for 15 and then we'll work our way down to nine or ten in whatever they decide but uh jason let's leave it here on episode number 642 of the DBR podcast. Thank you as always for listening. Again, if you have questions, topics that you want us to consider, we have a couple that are in, in basically in the shoot. We're just trying to figure out when to, when to deploy they're, them. They're gestating as we speak. They're, yes. they're right there. They're hibernating uh, or whatever you want to call it, but they're, they're, we'll have them on future shows. But if you have one that you want us to present as we move forward, dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Of course, it is mid-August. Very, very soon we'll start talking about football uh, because that is on the horizon. We are... 16 days away from the Duke's opener, or Duke football's opener against Elon. We will obviously have that a little bit closer to the start of football season. But for now, for Jason Evans, I am Donald Wine. This is the DBR Podcast. And now it is time for the Duke band to play us out and take us home. Yeah, yeah, yeah.